Good morning, everybody. Wonderful to see all your smiling faces coming to worship together, our Almighty God. Uh, I'm Pastor Sean, the lead pastor here. My wife is Amy. She's the better half of the pastoral team, our minister of pastoral care. Uh, and it's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege to welcome you to worship this morning. We do have some announcements. Uh, first of all, there is no Kingdom Prayer time tomorrow. It's the holiday Monday. So that means our bag lunch is pushed back a week. So we would normally have on the first, week, the first uh, Monday a bag lunch afterwards. That's what we're doing now. But we're going to push it back. So a week tomorrow, bring your bag lunch. We had a great time talking and sharing and just being together as the people of God, eating together, uh, breaking bread, as Acts has told us to do. Sunday school is available uh, during the sermon. There are kids' sheets available at the back on little clipboards if you're interested in those. Uh, welcome to the kids and to everybody. Uh, Women of the Word Fall Potluck. I actually have to turn around to get the actual de uh, details for this. September 28th from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. There's all the uh, details there. It does say if you have questions to contact Allison, our contact normally is Betty. Betty's at the back. She's going to wave her hand in the air. If you are interested in Women of the Word, Women of the Word, please speak to Betty. Wonderful ministry that we, uh, we join with the Lakeside and other churches uh, to do. Our fall fundraiser for the Pre uh, Pregnancy Care Center, one of the ministries we support, is going to be September 17th at 7 p.m. at Lakeside. Uh, please consider. Uh, it's free admission, but an offering is going to be taken so we can consider uh, how we're going to support, uh, continue to support the Pregnancy Care Center. Amy and I are excited because we've been invited to go for a tour and to see what their dynamic ministry is that's there. Uh, I, was, I received a phone call this morning to make an announcement about the pictures we do have pictures, don't forget, happening Tuesday and Wednesday for our, uh, for our new photo directory. There's two things we need to know about the pictures this week. First of all, please show up just a few minutes before, not like 20 minutes before. That's what I've been asked, is that we can, we can just show up a few minutes before. Um, they're going to come and get you, and it just kind of helps with the backlog so we're not all standing out in the driveway waiting to come in. Uh, secondarily, someone will be calling you sometime over the next couple of days to remind you that your, what your picture time is going to be, which Amy and I are always thankful for because there's about a 70% chance we might forget. So, uh, Also, it is a wonderful day because someone has come, or some ones have come home. I'm going to ask Brian and Diane to please come up so we can pray for you. <laughs> and I'm going to ask Brian Monahan if he'll come up as well. I'm going to go down. Just for the people who are recording, I'm going to come down. So speaking with the deacons, we, had, uh, we talked about it at the deacons board meeting and we prayed and asked, asked Brian and Diane if they would think and pray about it. Uh, we've, we've invited Brian to take a role on our pastoral team as an honorary associate pastor. And so this is a way, in a number of ways, to honor, obviously for those who don't know Brian, preceded me as the pastor here. They've taken the summer off, and, uh, and now we're coming back and taking this place. So we're honoring who Brian and Diane have been in our midst for these, these many years here at West Guilford Baptist, and also, also for, for Amy and I, for who they are uh, and how they've passed over the ministry to us. But we're also honoring Brian's role as kind of a community pastor. He's always been a community pastor. He's going to continue uh, doing pastoral care and, and taking some, some services at other churches like next week. And so we're blessing him to that ministry and also to future ministry in our midst. So we're honoring Brian, we're honoring both he and Diane, what he does in the community and what he's going to do for the future. And uh, he's going to be helping us with ideas and everything going forward. So we're so happy to have them, have them here. I'm going to give this to Brian Monahan. I'm going to give this to Amy, which we'll explain in just a second. We're going to get a nice picture. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to, we're just going to, sorry, my, my microphone came off. Uh, we're going to pray for you. And then Amy's going to give you something here. Okay, so loving God, I give you thanks for this wonderful man of God. I give you thanks for who he's been in our midst. And we give you thanks, Lord God, for this wonderful woman of God. And together, who they have been in our midst, the ministry they've had. And we, I just, on behalf of the deacons board, on behalf of the community and the power of the Holy Spirit, we commission you both in ministry here at, at West Guilford Baptist Church. We just ask the Lord God to come upon you 
and to infuse your ministry with his grace, that he would glorify himself to his glory and to your good. And if God's people said, amen. And Amy is going to pray for Diane, and she also has, uh, they put together a book from, uh, from your retirement party. Oh, and so wow. this is for you, for you both. Um, it's all the pictures. Tammy took a picture. Betty took a picture. And Leanne, actually, some of her pictures as well have made it into there. Wow. So I think they did a wonderful job. So on behalf of the, of the church, we're so glad to, to give that to you. And then I'm going to give this to Amy, and she's going to pray as uh, only Amy can. <laughs> <laughs> Lord God, thank you for Diane. Thank you for her gentle spirit, her warm presence, and who she is and who she is to the people around her. And Lord, I just pray that as she remains open to your leading in whatever this next season has, God, that you would guide her, that you would um, give her the, the rest, her and Brian, the rest that they've, that they've earned, and Lord, that you would lift them up oh, and show them the way, Lord. And bless it, Lord, we pray your blessing over the shape and the character that, that her ministry takes. All these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Going, buddy. Do apologize for that. I'm going to invite the worship team to come forward. And as they do, we just want to take a few moments to invite the Holy Spirit into our midst to bring us to a heart of worship before Him. Come, Holy Spirit, our souls inspire, Lord God. Fill your people, Lord God. Bring revival in our hearts, Lord. And revival in our church and infuse our worship with the power of your Holy Spirit. God's word says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding and all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. Amy's going to have some pastoral prayers for us and then we'll have worship. Oh Lord God, it is so good to be together and to come to you and Lord, we just praise you. We praise you for the, the return of Brian and Diane and um, just that we can be together, Lord. God, there are things that we come with from our weeks and we offer those things to you. The things we want to praise you for, the things we lament, the things we grieve about, the things we're nervous about, our worries, our cares. Lord, all of the things we lay at your feet we lay them there because we trust you, Lord, and we love you, and we've seen your faithfulness. And we pray for that once again, Lord. We pray for your faithfulness to continue in our midst, that you would be leading us, that you would be comforting us, that you would be granting us wisdom. Lord, we thank you for your mercy, and we thank you for your presence here with us. It is most welcome. Lord, your presence in our midst. God, we celebrate you this morning with our voices as we praise you, and we ask that it would be an incense to you, Lord Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. Let's stand together and sing. Yeah. 
Yeah. 
can follow Amy out to Sunday school, I'm told. Yes. <laughs> 25 minutes. Maybe 30, we'll see how long I go. <laughs> Let's pray together. Loving God, we pray for our young people as they go down for Sunday school. We thank you, Lord God, for a multi-generational church. I've lost track of the number of people, Lord, who've come and said, uh, it was wonderful to hear a baby in worship this morning, Pastor. It's praises to you, Lord God, from all generations. That's how we feel. So we pray you bless the children, bless the words that uh, Amy and Clark have for them this morning uh, as you op open your word for us as well. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So our sermon series is Acts. We're learning from the early church witness. Um, we're learning a lot about the DNA of the church right from the very beginning as we explore how we're going to go forward and how we're going to move forward as a congregation ourselves. So basically, um, I mean, I come from old school. As many of you know, I just retired from the military. I've got a couple of military stories in here. But one of the things we do is we love to summarize in summary. So here's our summarize, summary in summary. This is what we've learned so far. From Acts 1, we learn that the church is based on Jesus. It was instituted by Jesus. It was sent down the mountain into Jerusalem by Jesus. Second of all, we learned that the church is open to the Holy Spirit, whatever that may be, and it could be anything. It could be tongues of fire that send you out into the streets. It can be crazy, but we are open to it if that's what the Holy Spirit has for us. Uh, whatever the Holy Spirit has, the church is open to the Holy Spirit. The, whole, the, the church is committed to life together, to worship, to the prayers, to the teaching of the apostles, and to the breaking of bread. We're committed to life together, Acts 2, 42 to 47. If you're following along, we are bold in witness. We learn that from around Acts 3 to 4, uh, which we're going to see again this morning. And then the church also, we learned last week, has a generous heart. This week, we're going to learn that the church trusts in God's faithfulness. 
We trust that God is faithful. Because it's about him, it's not about us. So whatever he calls us to, he will be faithful in it. And as we go through our passage, we're going to be looking at Acts 5, verses 12 and following. And as we go through it, it's going to feel a little bit like Groundhog Day. Does anybody remember that movie? He kept waking up, and it was the same day over and over again. Who knows how many centuries this poor guy was doing that. It's going to feel a little bit like Groundhog Day, uh, because it's a very similar story to what we've already seen. And it's going to, be, it's going to look very similar. However, it's really in the details that the difference is going to be. So the title is, oh no, here we go again. All right, here we go again. It just kind of seems like it's the same thing happening over. But the difference is going to be in some key details. And the big idea for this sermon is God is large, he's in charge, and he's faithful to his people. The, it's a big word. The big theological word like marmalade, marmalade that we use for this is sovereignty. God is sovereign, and we trust, and we live in God's sovereignty. He's large, he's in charge, and he's what? Faithful. He's faithful to his people. I'm going to have a test during the sermon, and you're going to pass it now when you say that God is faithful. So I'm going to pray a little bit more, and then we're going to open the passage here. Uh, again, I'm reading from the ESV, Acts 5, starting at the 12th verse. Loving God, I pray that only the truth would be spoken, only the truth would be heard, and you would change us, Lord God, by your word. Amen. Now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people at the hands of the apostles, and they were all together in Solomon's portico. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. But the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is, the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. But when the officers came, they did not find them in the prison, so they returned and reported. We found the prison securely locked and the guards standing at the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now when the captain of the temple and the chief priests heard these words, they were greatly perplexed about them, wondering what this would come to. And someone came and said, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them in, but not by force, because they were afraid of being stoned by the people. And when they had brought them in, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, We strictly charged you not to teach in this name, yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior and gave repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. And so is the Holy Spirit, whom God has given to those who obey him. When they, meaning the leaders, heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. But a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders that the men be put outside for a little while. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care what you are about to do with these men. For before these days, the De Thaddeus rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a number of men, about 400, joined him. He was killed, and, he, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and drew away some of the people after him. He too perished and all who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I tell you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this undertaking is of man, it will fail. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You might even be found opposing God. So they took his advice 
When they had called in the apostles, they beat them, and they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and let them go. Then they left the presence of God, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that Christ is Jesus. The word of the Lord. Wow. Thank you, Lord God, for your word. So we go back to, to uh, verse 12. It's a powerful passage. I, I find a very power, powerful passage. We're in Solomon's portico. Okay, we're back there, kind of picture we've seen a few times now. Uh, I think we're, we're coming to realize that this is an important spot for the early church. This is the religious kind of hangout spot for the, for the early church community. It's in the court of Gentiles. What does that mean? It means everybody can be there. Everybody can't go into, into the, the temple, but Gentiles and women could go in to Solomon's portico. So it was a very important and a favorite center where you often found the Christians in this time. We see them over and over again preaching there. And there is an irony when we see, when we realize Solomon's porch, which is off to the side, we see the irony of the early church. And the irony of the early church is this. The true temple that God was building was out with the Gentiles and out with the women. The living church that God was building was the new temple. And it was across, literally just across, across the, uh, the way here, across the field, across the court from the old temple, which now the clock was ticking down on, the old temple. That's the irony of the early church, that the new temple is now built of all those who God is calling to himself. And the old temple, the clock was ticking. And in fact, we know from history, in 70 short years, it would be flattened by the Romans and wiped off the face of the earth by God because he is building his new temple. And here it is, off to the side, with the Gentiles and <gasps> the women. Because that, God loves everybody. And God is opening it up to everybody, not just to the elites. And so the ministry of the, the apostles we see is very focused on people. In particular, we hear over and over again about healing. We want to remember back to verse 430. If you look at verse, four, verse 430, the disciples had prayed for power from the Holy Spirit. And God is what? God is faithful. And he was faithful to their prayer. And we see all kinds of healings happening. And it takes us to verse 13. None of the rest dared to, dared to join them but the people held them in high esteem. It seems that the word from the leaders had gotten out to the general population, right? The word from the leaders, these, these, aren't, these aren't good people. Don't, don't, don't let us see you with the, with the Christians, with those Jesus followers. And so the unbelievers didn't want to be associated with the church, but as happens, the Spirit's starting to break through, and they're holding the Christians in high esteem. And friends, this happens. I remember being on a deployment number of deployments, in fact, or out in the field. And guys, when I had a chapel service, I get, I get a number of people at chapel service, but there's some people, they wouldn't be caught dead with their friends seeing them come to a chapel service with the chaplain, right? Because peer pressure, I was very hard army, hard charging culture. But it's very interesting, when they had a quiet moment alone with the pastor, with the chaplain, all kinds of questions, all kinds of deep thoughts that these young men and these young women have would come out. Wouldn't be caught dead, but the spirit breaks through. The spirit breaks through, even when there's peer pressure or cultural pressure happening. So the unbelievers didn't want to get in hot water, but they're watching and there's stirrings of the spirit. We never want to underestimate what the Holy Spirit is doing in people's lives. God is faithful and he's working there long before we get there. We never want to underestimate. God is faithful. His word doesn't return to him empty when we share it, Isaiah 55, 11. So when we share God's word, we have no idea what God's been doing previously in that person's life. And that takes us, and so uh, we see in verse 14, even though the people were intimidated, yet the numbers were being added more than ever. Big sad face for the leaders. It's not working, no matter how much pressure that you're putting on there. That takes us to verse 15, so that even so that they even carried out the sick to the streets and laid them in cots and mats, just as Peter came by, lest his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Now, in our time of hospitals and walk-in clinics, it's very easy to forget that 
Um, they didn't have anything like that. They had some rudimentary physicians, but I mean, if you were sick, if you were really sick, anybody who's been to, the, to a developing country knows this, has probably experienced this. When you're really sick in a developing country, it's bad news. Like, there's, there's not a lot of help for you. When you were really sick or something seriously was going on for you in Israel at that time, it was a desperate, desperate situation. And so when word gets out that actual healing is happening, people come from everywhere because they, they have no hope. They have no hope other than God in that. And they're, I mean, they're just, the passage says they're desperately laying their sick out in the streets just so Peter's shadow is going to fall on them. Now, I want you to think for a second about Peter. Like, this is a shocking change for him. He's a fisherman who denied Jesus, and now people are bringing their sick out just so his shadow would, could you imagine you're walking along? And, and now the passage, interesting, the passage doesn't actually say any of those folks were healed. I think what it really is showing is the desperation of people who are just on the outside and just need healing and need the touch of God. And it also just shows this amazing transformation, this wild transformation that's happened for Peter and for the apostles, when all of a sudden people start to show you with, this, uh, with esteem. But we do know, maybe, maybe, the, maybe the, 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 when the shadow fell, they didn't, they didn't get healed, but we do know that when they were prayed for, they did get healed. The passage does say that. The temple and the priests have nothing, the temple and the priests have nothing to compare with the spirit-filled church. Religion never has anything on the spirit-filled church. Except for one thing. I guess the leaders had one thing for the church. And if we look in verse 17, they had lots of this for the church. They were filled with jealousy. They were losing control of the situation. Um, the leaders, which we learned a couple of, over the last couple of weeks, these folks, they controlled everything within Jerusalem. The Sadducees controlled everything. They controlled the temple, and the temple was the center of the religious, the social, and the economic life of Jerusalem. They controlled everything. Can you imagine that kind of power over a city of that size, and of that magnitude, just that kind of reputation, and then all of a sudden you're losing, you're starting to lose control of the situation in your own temple. So they're filled, that's where they're filled with rage and they're filled with this jealousy. Whereas the church is being strengthened by unity, purity, and spiritual authority through the Holy Spirit. And that takes us to verse 17. The high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and they were filled with jealousy. I remember uh, in the Armored Corps, uh, there was an officer, his name was Steve. And Steve knew how to make an entrance. He was an officer, he was a leader of men, and one of the things that Steve knew how to do, he could make an entrance. And I remember we were in, we were in Wainwright. Anybody ever here been to Wainwright, Alberta? It's an amazing place where you can have all four seasons in one day. Like, seriously. <laughs> it, 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 and so you, when you train there, you bring every article of clothing, you're either wearing it all or not wearing it all. And so we were tired, we were worn out, we had done convoy training. I was tired, and my job was literally to sit in the back as a chaplain and make jokes on the radio. And I was tired. Okay, so we're... We're, we're, we're finished, and they have what's called the hot wash. Everybody's, everybody's parked their labs, their light armored vehicles all around, and all the soldiers are around, and Steve has his lieutenants there, he has his sergeants there, and it went, the convoy went well, but there's always something to learn. And so they're doing what's called the hot wash, and he has them doing that. Then all of a sudden, a bison CP, that's what, a bison command post, and that's what this is, uh, which is a sad old light armored vehicle, but that's what always, they always give the officer for some reason. And Steve, and, and they back that right up to the group, and it stops, and it, and everybody just kind of stops and like, what is this? And the back door comes down. The back doors come down on these like that. And it just comes down like, like Darth Vader. <laughs> Drops right down in front of him. We're all looking. And then out comes Steve wearing his beret. Obviously, he just showered, you know, and he had his Ray-Bans on. He looked like a superstar. And he came out and he rose up to his full height. And he was, and it's about like this. It's about, you can see it's up. It's about this far. So he, all the soldiers are there and everybody's just looking. He rose up. A leader has a way of just rising up, gripping the room, and taking control of the situation. And from then on, it was his show, and it was very obvious. I, I actually congratulated him afterwards for the amazing entrance. He said, I ah, know, I kind of planned it. But. So there is a way that leaders have of standing up and taking control of the room. It's not always good, 
if the leader has to stand up. As a senior officer, if I had to grip a situation for you as a junior officer, it was probably not a good day for you, right? When the old man has to get his hands dirty, things have really gone sideways. And so the passage here says things have gotten so bad that this leader, the leader, the high priest, stands up to his full height, full height probably sat, you know, gives a little sideways glance at, at the captain of the temple guard, like, don't worry, I got it. I'll do your job for you. And he acts with all his cronies. The apostles are thrown in prison. And, you know, for the, for the, for the high priest, it's an easy day. They're in prison. Problem solved. But God is what? God is faithful. Verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out. The critical moment in life. Those critical moments in life, God shows he is large, he's in charge, and he's faithful. We want to think about the critical moments in our lives. When we ask why. Why is this happening to me? Why is this happening over in this situation? When we're challenged by temptation. When we're challenged because there's opposition to, to God's word in the world. Those are critical moments, friends. And they're opportunities to trust God and watch him be faithful in our lives. We want, God wants to turn those critical moments into steps on our path to glory. And that's what he does for the disciples. This is a huge step on their path. He sends an angel because he's faithful. And I love that the angel talks about this life in verse 20. Go, stand, go and stand in the temple and speak to all the people all the words of this life. Faith in Jesus is not a religious add-on. It's a life. It's not an add-on. When we, when we treat it like an add-on, take us to our next slide, please. When we treat it like an add-on, this is what it looks like. You know, I like to paint. I'm a member of the Lions Club. Um, you know, I like to shop. Maybe I'm a political person. I like politics. Oh, yeah, also, I go to church, and I'm a Christian. All right, it's just one of the things that I do in my life. I would submit to you that that's more like a religious view of life. It's just kind of an add-on. It's one of those things that I do. I just kind of check check that box. The Bible, and the, the, the angel himself here, is describing a life of faith. Not just one thing that I do. All of life is where my spirituality is worked out. Life is where we take our place in God's big story. The religion of Jesus is not just an add-on. It's an all-of-life thing. Life is where we take our place in God's big story, and God shows his faithfulness. That takes us to verse 21, and when they heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. I think when an angel shows up and tells you to do something, and it's obviously an angel from God speaking the word, you should probably do that thing. So that's what they do. Uh, that's pretty much what you do. Is they go out and they preach in the temple, and then, you know, the story flashes. Luke's kind of taken us all over the place. The story flashes very quickly to verse 21. Or sorry, the, the story very, flashes very quickly to the council. The council is called. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people, and they sent to the prison to have them brought in. Bring them in. And there's crickets. And there's crickets. And if you're the captain of the temple guard and you're standing at the prison going, all right, maybe you tell them. And they come in. And again, we want to remember, for these guys in the, in, the, in, the, in the Senate, this group, they pull the strings, everybody else dances. So when you send for somebody, and it takes longer than it should, and all you're hearing are crickets, they're not used to this. They're not used to this at all. But God is being faithful. That takes us to, and we see just from verses 22 to 24, I think it's really summed up in this. They were greatly perplexed. They wondered where this would lead. They really have to be thinking, you know, if you're, if you're kind of in the back bench, you're one of those guys in the back bench, you're probably thinking, this is not going to end well for us. Like, this is not going very well. There's a point at which, when everything is going wrong, you just start to think to yourself, this isn't going to end well. 
And then finally, someone comes in verse 25 and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and they're teaching the people. And they go out and they invite the disciples to come back in. It's, uh, it was not unusual, actually, for the temple guard in certain situations to be afraid of the people. Remember when Jesus overturned all the tables in Luke? It just, they kind of, they didn't, they didn't do anything because they were afraid of the people because the people held Jesus in such high esteem. So it's not unusual for them to be afraid of getting stoned. I wonder if it had happened previously. Who knows? Uh, But again, we're seeing a replay after that. When they invite them to come in, the disciples are are nonviolent. They go go along with them. Then we see a replay of verses of chapter 3 and 4. We have a healing. We have Solomon's porch. We have a council. We have the high priest. And it's it's just like a bad dream for the leaders that will not end. And in the details, we see it's just going to keep on getting worse for them. When we're working against God's will in our church or in our lives, there's a tendency for things to go back from bad to worse. You can be the leader of the temple in Jerusalem, but if you're working against God's will, things go from bad to worse. In the life of someone who's turned their life over to Jesus, you know, working against God's will, God's will could be harboring a secret sin that we think we can get away with. Can't hide anything from God. God wants to bring you out of the dark into the light, raise you to a higher level of living. As a church, going against God's plan, God's will could be going against the plain guidance of God's revealed word. There are churches that do this when they teach lifestyles, plainly at at, at odds with God's word. And then we start to see that drift. We start to see a lot of these churches empty out for a reason. As a people who have turned our lives over to Jesus, we want to, be, we want to strive to be in his will. We want to constantly look to Jesus with our eyes and with our hearts, trusting that he's the best way. Friends, every decision for Jesus is a step towards glory. Every decision for Jesus is a step towards glory. And we're about to learn from the disciples if we're, disciples, if we're in God's will, even when things look bad from our limited point of view, God will use it for his glory and our good because God is what? God is faithful. He is large, he's in charge, and he's faithful to his people. He who calls you is faithful, and he will surely do it. And so the disciples are brought in, and it's a replay of Acts 4, to be honest, uh, from verses 27 to 32. And they were brought, had them brought in, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, we strictly charge you not to teach in this name, yet here you are filling Jerusalem with your teaching, filling my city with your teaching, and intending to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the disciples answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised Jesus, whom you killed. Yes, you're right. We're bringing it on you, high priest, by hanging him on a tree. God exalted him at his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses to these things. Not you, we. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. And we come to the critical moment in verse 33. Critical moment here. The leaders are only having their bullying. The apostles have God, so it goes up a notch. And when they heard this, they were enraged, and they wanted to kill them. And we can start, we can start to understand how they've gotten to this point. It's getting worse and worse. It's this bad dream. Let's just kill them and get this over with. The, the one commentary... I, said, I had used a really great term for the amount of rage. They said they had this intoler, intolerable obstinacy of the disciples who would have, who, they say, this is my city, and you're going to bring this man's blood on us. And then the disciples say back, yes. Oh, well, okay, we're going to kill you now because you're not, you're not, you're not giving in to our bullying. They turn murderous. Note to leaders, when violence and threats are all you have, probably a sign you're not in the will of God. Um, church discipline is important, but it's always in the hope of restoring people to Jesus. Here, they just want them dead. They just want them gone. But God is faithful, and at least someone in the group seems to be seeking wisdom, and we get the introduction of a very important individual, Gamaliel here, but a Pharisee in the council named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, and held in honor by all the people, stood up and gave orders that the men... Uh, be put outside. He was the most prominent teacher of that time, Gamaliel, as far as being a Pharisee. Does anybody know he had one very important student for us? Does anybody know who that was? 
perhaps someone who's going to get converted later on, Saul, who would become Paul, is actually his, one of his students. And so Paul, when he's touting his credentials as a leader within Israel, says, I was taught by Gamaliel. I was taught by this guy. That's how important Gamaliel is, is at that time. Uh, he was a Pharisee. He's a minority in the council. But his name carried weight to the point that he can say, everybody stop, take those guys outside, and let's have a talk. Okay, so very important individuals. Uh, and he just shares the wisdom, says, you know, if this is of God, if it's not of God, it's going to go away. If it is of God, we had better not be trying to oppose this. At least one person is following wisdom. So they bring the apostles back in. When we look at verse 40, they call the apostles and they beat them. Um, they're not killed, though. Okay, they're beaten, so I guess it's probably better. Beating's not great. I'd rather not get a beating today. <laughs> but it's better to go out on your two feet than feet first, right? So they're not killed. They are beaten. Uh, and I just wonder, I don't think they did, but I mean, they found out later, obviously, but I wonder if they knew how close they came to being killed. If it wasn't for one voice that stood up, if the Spirit hadn't worked in one person's life, they probably would not have lived. But God is what? God is faithful, and they get away with a beating. Yeah. Better than dead. Verses 41 to 42. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer, suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that, Christ, that, that the Christ is Jesus. Friends, they are living the reality of God's sovereignty. He's large, he's in charge, and he's faithful to his people. So why does this matter? Why is this, where does this come home to us? Think trusting God can be, tr can be really tough? Uh, it can be. When, when times are tough, when bad things happen, when we're tempted, when we feel intimidated maybe, just to change the gospel a little bit to make it more palatable for the world. But as we've seen, those are critical moments and they're opportunities to trust God and watch him be faithful. Like, Peter's just along for the ride here. The apostles are just along for the ride, watching the greatness of God happen over and over and over again in their lives. He turns these critical moments, just like he does for the disciples here, where he just opens up and they're, they're going to go out and add more and more to the number. This critical moment becomes a step on the path to glory. And that's what God wants to do for us. Every, George Sweeting said, every temptation is an opportunity for us to draw nearer to God. So maybe we should take our temptations and say, instead of, oh, I just don't want to give in to this, say, no, this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to live the sovereignty of God in my life and to trust God with this moment as a step towards glory. So our response, as we've walked with the, with the disciples, I think we can discern they've entered kind of this Spiritual feedback loop. Uh, you're not going to find this chart in your Bible, but um, this is just kind of the brainchild of Sean. But it, it basically, it always starts with God's faithfulness. God is faithful. God's faithfulness leads to our trust. Trust in God leads to steps of faith, and then God shows he's faithful. Rinse and repeat. And it just keeps happening. And we see, we, we watch the disciples as we go through Acts. They're just living this. This is the, the living God's sovereignty. This is the life. When I say a dynamic faith, I'm always saying it's a dynamic faith. This is what I'm talking about. It's not just, you know, well, I'm just going to take steps of faith and try to earn God's favor. No, I'm going to watch God work. I'm going to put my trust in him. I'm going to walk in faith, and then I'm going to watch him work, and he's just going to continue. And it's all based on God's faithfulness. Psalm 34, 8 says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts who takes refuge in him. The disciples have tasted. The disciples have seen. And they take all the refuge in God to the point that beatings, whips, they were whipped, scourged, just like Jesus. Three on the front, three on the back, three on the front, three on the back. Even that leads them and serves the purpose of their holiness. Trusting God and experiencing his faithfulness leads to more trust and more faithfulness the dynamic life of the Spirit. We trust that God is large, He's in charge, and He's what? Faithful. I just invite you to jump into God's faithfulness this week. 
I invite us as a church to jump into God's faithfulness, life in the Spirit, open to us through Jesus. We want to be a people in a church that steps into God's faithfulness. The disciples didn't know, they probably didn't know that they came close to death. But what did they know? They knew God was large, he was in charge, and he was faithful, and they trusted that. And everything worked for their good and his glory. Lamentations 3, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That leads us to our big finish. Pulled this from the cutting room floor. There's an analogy, an old analogy of faithfulness. Uh, it's of two frogs. And Darko, they're smart frogs, okay? You have to follow me here. These are very smart frogs. So they're two frogs, and they fall into a tub of cream at a farm. And again, remember, smart frogs, okay? One of them looks at the sides of the butter churn and says, I'm not getting out of here. Floats to the bottom, never going to be heard of again. Well, maybe someone will hear from him again, but it won't be a big surprise. It's at the bottom of the butter churn. Big sad face. The other frog, though, is smart and darko, smart and determined. Okay, this, remember, smart and determined. And you determine, you just keep swimming. Something's going to happen. If I just keep swimming, something's going to happen. And it did. He kept kicking and churning, and finally he found himself on a solid platform of butter, hopped out to safety. Just keep kicking, friends. You never know how God will surprise you. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you and guard you against the evil one. 2 Thessalonians 3.3. 3. Let's pray together. Loving God, give us opportunities this week to trust in your faithfulness, Lord God. Give us aha moments as a church and as individuals where it's like, this is that moment. This is that critical moment. Help me, Lord, to turn to you. Take a step towards glory by your power, Lord God. And show yourself faithful to your people in powerful ways. Bring us closer to you, Lord God. Glorify yourselves in us. To our to our our goodness, Lord, to our good, Lord God. We thank you that you're faithful, and we love you, Lord Jesus. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. Do we have a song before communion, or are we just doing communion? Just communion. Okay. I'm going to invite the deacons to come forward, uh, Gary and Brian. Okay, I've been told, I'll give you that, brother. You have a seat. I've been told we need a, a little bit of a, a little bit of instruction here, okay? I tried this when I was doing communion at the hospital, and then I, I, I did mine. It burst open. Everything went everywhere. I'm like, I, I'll, I'll get it the second time. I did it the second time. It burst over, open, and everything went everywhere. You'll notice that there's no doily on here because I don't want to get <laughs> juice all over it. So just take the plastic flap. You take the plastic flap and open that up. The bread will be right there for you. Look at that. Wow. And then when we're done with the bread, you take the purple flap and you pull the perfect, the purple flap, the, the, uh, the clear, flap first. clear plastic flap first and then the metal purple flap. Is that metal? Second. Purple All right. Flap. The purple flap. Clear and purple. Clear as mud. All right. Receive God's word. This is Paul in 1 Corinthians 11. For I was... For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after, saying, The cup, this cup, is the, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself or herself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. So loving God, we just take a moment to remember anything that we have to bring before you and confess. We know you are faithful, Lord God. We trust in your faithfulness and ask that you would take these, these temptations and these trials that we have 
and turn them into critical moments where we can trust you. All our cares and all our sins we cast on the cross and the precious grace that you offer us through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I invite Brian to say our prayer over the bread. celebrating you from the risen tomb. Mm. Lord, you are now sitting beside your father right on his right hand. And Lord, we remember the blood you shed and the bones that were broken in your body, Lord. And we ask the blessings on this element this morning in remembrance of those, the beaten body of, of you. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. I invite you to take the body of Christ. One. I invite Gary to offer offer a prayer for us. He died on the cross for us, shed his blood, Lord, so our sins might be washed clean as snow. We're just so thankful, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us. In Jesus' name, amen. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until, his come, until he comes. We proclaim your death, Lord God. We proclaim what you've done for us on the cross for sins, and we proclaim that you have broken the power of death and broken the power of our sins, Lord God, and raise us with you to new life. All these things we give thanks, Lord God, and God's people say, Amen. Amen. I invite the worship team to come up and offer a song for us. Will you stand with us? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Of his spirit washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission. Perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descending, bring from above echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest, 
Dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. God bless.